presents the London programme. London faces a campaign of terror directed against the public. The IRA wants to create chaos in the capital. So how should we respond? Tonight, the London programme reports from the capital and from Belfast. We talk to a former terrorist, one of the men behind the 1973 IRA campaign against the mainland. Belfast has been brought to its knees uh, time and again by a series of bombs or hoax bomb warnings, and the city's life has been disrupted repeatedly. There's no doubt that London can be brought to its knees. This was the scene inside Victoria Station on Monday morning after a bomb placed in a litter bin exploded on the station's busy concourse. The explosion at 7.46 killed one man and injured 43 others. It was the capital's second bomb of the day. A device placed on a deserted platform at Paddington had exploded at 4.10. There were no injuries there. In the aftermath of the Victoria bomb, Controversy centered on the question of whether the police should have closed the stations. The bomb went off while police were searching for it, after a warning was phoned to the London Transport Travel Centre at 7 a.m. The British Transport Police defended their decision to keep the station open. There are many thousands, tens of thousands of people coming into the capital, and we had no specific threat at that time, and the judgment made, which I made, was that the station should be searched, there should be high vigilance, but it was not until there was a second device that instantly arrangements were made to evacuate and close all stations. Most commuters supported this decision. Yeah, I mean, they get so many hoax calls. They close the stations every time they get a hoax call, even though I know they've been a bomb, bomb at Paddington, then obviously they'll be closing all the time. I think it's very difficult to stop anything like this. Uh, I cannot see what one can do. Life must carry on. At first, faced with the loss of life and injuries suffered on Monday, the fear that there would be other bombs planted was dominant. But as the week has passed, it's become clear that causing civilian casualties is not the IRA's primary aim. I guess the purpose behind it primarily has been to hit what the IRA call economic targets and uh, structural targets within Britain, uh, prestige targets like the Stock Exchange, the Territorial Army, uh, the railway stations, the bus stations, they fit into this pattern. The intention isn't necessarily to kill. The IRA doesn't at a meeting decide what we're going to do is kill lots of people. If the aim was disruption, the IRA's commanders will be celebrating tonight. For five days, London's transport system has been reduced to chaos. On Monday, all 14 mainline railway stations were closed until 4 o'clock. 12 tube stations were also closed, disrupting journeys by an estimated 400,000 passengers. There were a further 19 hoax calls and reports of suspect packages. On Tuesday, another nine hoaxes and false alarms closed two mainline stations and 15 tube stations. In the biggest scare, more than 5,000 passengers had to be led to safety through the underground tunnels on foot. Two suspect packages had stopped trains on the central line. There wasn't any order. They had no evacuation plan. It was two hours before we even heard from the driver. They didn't know what to do. The picture on Wednesday, 11 stations closed, and Thursday, another four stations was little better. This morning, all mainline stations briefly closed yet again. Weary Londoners had had enough. It's taken me, on average, about three hours to get to work. Just the undergrounds being closed and Victoria being closed, Euston being closed. It's dreadful. Pretty disgusted, yeah. Um, I hope it gets back to normal next week. Well, I understand it would, but I don't know. The explosions here at Victoria and at Paddington Station 
following so closely on the mortar bomb attack on number 10 Downing Street, has signalled a new phase of IRA violence. And it's clear that at the centre of their current strategy lies an assault on the capital itself. But this campaign seems to be different to previous IRA attacks in London. Rather than indiscriminate bombing, the terrorists seem to have targeted London's transport system in a bid to disrupt the city's daily life, a tactic they've used for many years in Belfast. So tonight, the London programme examines just how likely they are to succeed and asks what we can do to combat the terrorists' campaign. Londoners are no strangers to IRA bombs. Explosions like the one at Mill Hill have been taking place regularly for three years now. But what marked out those attacks from this week's was that they were all aimed at military targets. The IRA has attacked civilians in the capital before. In 1973, they began a campaign that took 24 lives. Bombs planted at Guildford and other towns hit military and non-military personnel alike. In many cases, no warnings were given. There seemed little concern for human life. Shane O'Doherty belonged to the IRA for 17 years. Today, he campaigns against violence by all sides. Now a student in Dublin, he served over 14 years in prison for his part in the 70s bombing campaign. The aim, he says, was to put the IRA's claims high on the political agenda. I engaged in a letter bomb campaign against politicians, generals and, and the establishment, partly because I felt that bombs in Northern Ireland were a waste of time. People weren't paying any attention to them. And a stock Belfast phrase at, at, at the time was that when Northern Ireland is dying of pneumonia in terms of bombs and violence, nobody cares. But when there's a sneeze in London, the whole world looks on. And in fact, for very small letter bomb devices, there was worldwide publicity. The IRA continued to use these tactics until public reaction to bombings like the one at Harrods convinced their leaders that civilian casualties were too politically costly. At Harrods, five people died and 91 were injured. It set back the IRA's propaganda efforts by years, particularly in those countries where they looked for financial support. It was thought at the time, uh, not only in Britain, but also in Ireland, and of course the majority of Irish people condemn all of these activities, and elsewhere, the United States and Europe, to be the epitome of mindless violence, one which had no causal connection whatsoever with the political aim which it was said to support. So that the Knightsbridge or Harrods bomb was in my judgment, a turning point away from that tactic which we describe really as pure terror. The Gulf War may have provided one powerful reason to revive this tactic. For six months, it has deprived them of vital publicity. But Shane O'Doherty believes that a more important reason is what the IRA leaders see as a new political opportunity. After Margaret Thatcher left office, they would hope to talk to the person who succeeded Margaret Thatcher. And, um, you know, I've heard Repu uh, Republican leaders stating that they feel that Major is a more pragmatic leader and that they would hope to deal with him. No side wants to arrive at the, at the negotiating table um, in a state of claimed weakness or ineffectiveness. The IRA's aims for its new campaign are much the same as in the 70s. What is different is their tactics. They've developed a much more complex approach. The IRA have always said uh, certainly recently, since they have uh, become much more politically aware, uh, that their aim is to bomb their way to a negotiating table. Now, you don't do that by terrorising uh, people. You use more sophisticated means than that. Um, just the disruption uh, to uh, uh, London's normal way of commuting and daily way of life would be enough to ensure the IRA uh, the continuance of the IRA message to say, listen, chums, we're still here. And it could be much more effective uh, than, than, than simply blasting away at uh, civilian targets. The IRA's new strategy of disruption could apply anywhere in the country, but they've chosen to target London. One reason is that attacks on the capital and the seat of government attract more publicity. But a second, less obvious reason is that London is simply more vulnerable to their tactics than anywhere else in Britain. The IRA campaign exploits a key weakness, London's dependence on mass transport. The point of the, uh, the train station bombings was to try and establish that they are prepared to put bombs in those places. 
What that means is that uh, the authorities have to take seriously even anonymous hoax calls. And one would guess that in the future what they'll do is if the hoax calls aren't being t taken seriously, you wouldn't be surprised if they would return to this and put some more bombs in train stations. That in turn will help to keep the security forces and the transport people on the hop all the time. It means they have to react and that, and when they react, it means, that means that they have to disrupt communications. Shane O'Doherty believes that London is now a priority target for the most experienced terrorists. They've been fighting a war over here for 20 years and it hasn't made a great deal of impact. Whereas if you, if you fight 1% of that war in London, everybody's taking note. The politicians are taking note, the parliament is taking note, the press are taking note. I think it's a case of almost exporting the best of their operators and the best of their weaponry to London because they'll make the impact there. He's no longer involved with the IRA, but the tactics remain familiar. They were able to mount such a sophisticated operation against 10 Downing Street. Um, obviously, they've got top teams there. They've got all the technology they need for a long, drawn-out campaign. I think that's a simple fact. You would anticipate that they both intend and have a capability to continue doing this in the capital. I would say that's, say that's very definite, yeah. It's now clear that the IRA wants to wage a kind of economic and psychological war against the capital through repeated disruption. At the same time, it wants to avoid civilian deaths that would provoke a powerful public reaction against its cause. It's a difficult balance to strike. But here in Belfast, the IRA's had plenty of practice because these are exactly the kind of tactics they've employed for over two decades to try to bring this city's normal life to a halt. So we've come to Northern Ireland to find out just how those tactics have worked and what new kinds of assaults London can expect in the future. This government advertisement was aimed at reviving business life in the city. It provoked a violent response. The IRA then set upon a, a, a counter strategy and they said, well, we'll knock the buzz out of the city centre. Let's go to the buzz, let's go! Eamon Malley has lived and worked in Belfast for nearly two decades. He's a political journalist and wrote what people here say is the definitive book about the provisional IRA. To what extent are the IRA able to disrupt transport in Belfast on a regular basis? Oh, it's very simple. It means uh, time out of number, they have brought this city to a standstill by a series of hoax bombs. Maybe sometimes there's a real bomb. So, I mean, it's, it's such a simple tactic. All they do is uh, pick up the phone, ring a few newsrooms, ring the Samaritans, ring a few hospitals and say, look, there are 10 bombs planted in the city centre. The security services have no choice but pull the city to a standstill, clear areas, search for cars, suspect cars, etc. It's a very simple tactic, and it could take you two hours maybe to get out of the city centre at times. Friday evening, for example, is a, is a favourite time. Late night shopping. I mean, so they've used these tactics repeatedly. The IRA has also taken a more direct toll on the province's economy in attacks on shops and industry. The IRA planted a series of incendiary bombs in the Greater Belfast area in and around the Christmas period. That particular exercise inflicted about £25 million worth of damage on key stores and on shopping centres, furniture stores, etc. It would have cost the IRA about £200, I presume, to make those incendiary devices. They possibly used women to drop them in the shops. It would be so simple, as they understand that all you would need would be a, a bomb the size of a cassette, and a girl could be in checking a skirt, give the impression that she's going to buy a skirt or a dress, and literally drop the little bomb. Belfast has survived the IRA's campaign of disruption, but only at a high price to its quality of life and its economic fortunes. Yet on most days, it manages to look like any other provincial city centre. And it's here that Belfast pays the highest price of all. On the surface, there's normality. But underneath, a huge and expensive security operation. Northern Ireland's million and a half people are policed by 30,000 security personnel, costing 700 million pounds. London's force, the same size, polices five times as many people. They have beefed up the security presence. There's a greater vigilance in the city centre now. There's, you, you will always find police officers on the beat around the place, keeping an eye on the situation. You've got security personnel who would be civilians and they would be checking bags of people going in and out of shops. The essence of the Northern Ireland approach is 
to put safety first, whatever the cost to the normal life of the city, isn't it? Absolutely. If it means abnormality, if it means inconvenience, you've got to live with it. The police say here, life comes firstly and inconvenience comes secondly. I think the community here has learned to live with it. And the reality is that ultimately, perhaps very painfully, London will come to the same conclusion. From what we've seen here, Belfast appears to have responded to the IRA's campaign of disruption with a decision to protect its citizens' lives at all costs, no matter what that means for the business of living and working here. No one believes that such a policy could be transferred wholesale to the capital. But in the light of the Belfast experience, how should London respond to a prolonged terrorist campaign? In the aftermath of Monday's bombings, most Londoners we spoke to seemed adamant that their city should not go down the same road as Belfast, even if it meant accepting risks. I'm not going to give in to terrorism. I'm going to be... I've got to go to work. Uh, and my mother put it in a nutshell yesterday. She said during the war they were bombing all the time and the train stayed open and we still went to work and we carried on living. But it's not going to stop anybody coming to work or indeed uh, achieve any aims that anybody might have. But by Wednesday, the stiff upper lip was beginning to tremble. Transport Minister Malcolm Rifkind hinted that Londoners might have to start accepting a new Mr. level of disruption to their daily lives. I'm sure the House will want to join me in delivering two important messages. The first is to ordinary members of the travelling public. Their continuing vigilance is absolutely vital. No matter how much disruption may result from a false alarm, for example, a suspect package that turns out to be wholly innocent, it is better to ensure that disruption than to take the risk of a successful terrorist attack. If the and his Labour shadow appeared to be even more inclined to a safety-first policy. They have to live with these threats and use the public, use the staff, make them much more available to security checks and controls. And if necessary, why don't we put gates on all our stations? You look at the main road stations at the moment, you could put gates on them and control the entry at evening when these packages may be deposited. That is probably going to be a permanent feature of our life. And if it's necessary to do to protect innocent civilians, then we have to do it. But what would a safety first policy cost London? The police would be the first to pay the price of an attempt to make London as secure as Northern Ireland. Brian Hilliard is a respected authority on policing. He says the Met's ability to cope with crime would quickly be eroded. If the police take every hoax call or every apparently genuine call seriously, it's going to mean that uh, there's going to be no police resources left to deal with the everyday crime in the capital. Been 400 calls between Monday and Thursday. Uh, if you think each of these calls, if they took at least 10 policemen to each one, but 400 calls is about 4,000 policemen tied up for uh, three or four hours. London's economy would be the second victim of a safety first policy. With businesses already hit by recession and the Gulf War and by everyday transport problems, for many, a prolonged IRA campaign would be terminal. Something like £10 billion a year was the cost to companies in London and the South East as a result of congestion. There comes a point when you push the costs, I imagine, beyond what is possible for a company to bear. And if the costs, the additional costs of security were such that it made it uncompetitive for a company to operate in London, then clearly we would have to face that, that we would lose companies who would decide that it was cheaper, it was safer, it was better to operate in a, in a city other than London. The IRA campaign presents London with a stark dilemma. Should we always put the risk to human life, however small, above the health of the city as a whole? If we think that um, perhaps on 6 o'clock on Monday morning they'd taken uh, the call seriously, they would have saved one man's life. But on the other hand, the capital would have come to a standstill. A safety-first policy of the kind applied in Belfast would be hugely expensive in London. What's more, it would threaten the capital's status as a desirable place to live and to work. But simply trying to carry on life as before has its own dangers. For the IRA's hoax policy to work, its threat must be credible, and that means that sometimes the bombs will be genuine. To put it bluntly, unless we take new steps to prevent it, in a sustained campaign, Monday morning's tragedy will be repeated. 
So can we find any way to stop the IRA planting its bombs in the first place? Merlin Rees, who's been both Home Secretary and Northern Ireland Secretary, believes that the key to stopping the IRA's campaign lies in improved intelligence. Your problem is getting your information on a strange group uh, who come in from outside, get a job here, work for some length of time, are sleepers, and then they emerge. It's much more difficult to find them than it is in Belfast. It's quite remarkable in Belfast. People will say, he's in the IRA, he's, he's from this, he's from the other. The, the community knows a great deal of what, goes, of what goes on. You might almost say in a typically Irish way. That's not so in London. The problem is that here in the capital, a relatively small number of people can disappear into the crowd. Any attempt to mount an effective intelligence effort against the IRA would be hugely expensive. It is calculated that uh, for every one mission the IRA mount in Northern Ireland, they have to abandon seven um, because of security force uh, surveillance, which is intensive. It would be impossible to mount the same sort of uh, covert uh, or an even overt surveillance uh, on the massive uh, flow of commuters in and out of London each day. There is no security solution to, to the problem of an IRA campaign in London. I was involved in one myself in 1973, and it was supremely easy. I was not arrested until two years after my involvement in a London bombing campaign. They never got me, and they never got anybody associated with me during those two years. One criticism that has surfaced this week is that staff reductions at railway stations, some 50% in the last 20 years, say the unions, allow terrorists to operate more freely. But even if there were more staff, they'd have to know what to look for. Even policemen make mistakes. This officer failed to spot the Victoria bomb, even though he searched the bin where it was hidden. Well, I started a check of the area, checking the bins and actually went to the, uh, the bin where the explosion was about three minutes before the bomb actually went off. And uh, all I could actually see in the bins was just litter. Uh, we're talking about pre preventative measures, like the use of sniffer, uh, police sniffer dogs, uh, which were in almost daily use in the 1970s, but which were totally absent uh, from the scene uh, and the run up to the tragedy of Victoria. It's not enough to tell uh, workers in any mainline station to watch out for what they think is a suspicious object uh, without them being enlightened as to what a suspicious object might be. Brian Hilliard accepts that such measures are of value, but primarily for preventing public anxiety rather than catching the IRA. Police have got to be seen to be reacting strongly to a terrifying crisis. Uh, but the truth is that that is what they're doing. They're providing reassurance. They are not actually finding the terrorists. They are de perhaps deterring them. Many believe that London has another unique and fundamental problem. With no single authority in charge of disaster planning and dealing with emergencies, there's not only potential for confusion and panic, but also for danger when a bomb does hit. What I think we would feel a lot more confident was that if there were emergency plans available to take care of any uh, risk that did occur. Um, and I, I think, you know, some people have said that one is creating alarm. I don't think people are necessarily alarmed if they know what the risk is and they know what the procedures are. I think when you get a lot of people in the underground and they don't know how to get out and they don't know what's going on and they don't know what the risk is, then you're likely to get panic. Unless there's a good organisation and one knows what one is doing, then I think perhaps sometimes the wrong decision can be taken. It doesn't solve the issue, but at least we ought to do what they've done in Belfast and that is put our mind to s mitigating the worst effects of disruption. But some politicians believe that how much we improve coordination and planning, the main responsibility for facing the terrorist threat rests with each individual. What the British people have to do is to maintain their present policy of being vigilant, of being aware and doing all that they can, both as individuals and as people working in buildings, to be on their guard and the police have to continue to collect intelligence with a view to making arrests. But life must continue as normal. 
Meanwhile, ordinary Londoners are facing next week's travel with the mixture of courage and humour that the city's made its trademark since the Blitz. How long this mood will survive daily disruption remains to be seen. This is my home and I live here and I work here and I'm not going to be intimidated by anybody. If your number's going to come up, it's going to come up whether you'll get blown up in Victoria or knocked down by a bus in Sussex. If we all give up, then they've all won, haven't they? That's the answer.